Welcome to The Green Rush, a podcast about the business of cannabis. On a weekly basis, Ann Donahoe and Lewis Goldberg talk with the CEOs, politicians, and cultural icons driving the cannabis industry forward. This week, Lewis and Ann speak with Tahira Rematula, who Fortune Magazine has called one of the top five most powerful women in pot, and Business Insider has deemed one of the rising stars of the marijuana investment scene. Tahira is the chief financial officer at a company called M-Tech Acquisition Corporation, which is one of the few publicly traded cannabis-focused companies on the NASDAQ, carrying the ticker symbol MTECU. Under her leadership, MTech completed a $50 million IPO earlier this year and has set its sights on acquiring companies with a particular sector focus that includes compliance, business intelligence, brand development, and media. Tahira is unique because she not only has financial chops, but she also runs one of the most recognized consumer brands in the space, Marley Natural. Don't sit back, lean forward. Now, on to the conversation. Welcome to Hira. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you guys. So we're going to go back in time. Take us back to Yale. You're studying for your MBA at the Yale School of Management. Uh, did you ever think it would lead you to a career in cannabis? Absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I think it surprised a lot of people, including myself, when I decided to pursue something in the cannabis industry after school. I came from a pretty structured, traditional background in financial services and had a little bit of nonprofit and social equity work mixed in. Uh, but I always kind of knew that the finance wasn't the right place for me, but did not know that cannabis would be the right one. Um, so I always had an interest in social impact, and I didn't know exactly what that looked like when I went into business school, but wanted to combine entrepreneurship, venture capital, social impact, and then was lucky enough to come across cannabis. All right, so are your fellow graduates, are they looking at you like, what the hell did you do? Or how do I get in on this? What are their, <laughs> do you ever talk to them? Oh yeah, a very, very close group of people who came out of Yale. Um, a lot of them, when I decided to take the role at the end of business school, definitely thought I was crazy, <laughs> uh, as did professors and management at the school. But on the other side of that, I also had a lot of people who were very encouraging and, you know, helped me level set a little bit to think of this as a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, I had one professor who said, this could be the most interesting thing that you ever do. Don't worry about the fact that maybe you won't have a job in like six months and all this <laughs> grad school debt. Uh, but put that aside, it could still be, you know, something very interesting. And they were absolutely right. Now, fast forward a couple of years, and I get calls all the time from people who are interested in the space, want to get into the space, or it now correlates to something they're working on that's not in the industry, uh, because there is so much more overlap when it comes to products, technology, even investment banking and research. So it's been a really interesting couple of years to see that transition from people thinking that I was absolutely crazy to thinking that I was a genius. Which I'm you're okay definitely, with. You're, you're clearly a genius. We're <laughs> obviously all clearly geniuses to me. Yes. Honest, right? Um, so, you know, where you are today is not where you started your career. You, you were at Privateer, which is one of the biggest uh, players in the industry. And when you were there, you, you ran the Marley Naturals brand, which is, you know, the, the Bob Marley family brand. Now that you're no longer with them, what do you think about celebrity brands um, in the cannabis space? Do they have legs? Is it just a gimmick? You know, do, do consumers care? I continue to believe that brands will play a significant role in the future of cannabis. To me, it very much looks like there's an element of cannabis that looks like consumer packaged goods, so just traditional CPG. Uh, but it's also really competitive and difficult. So for anybody who's ever built a brand, whether it's from scratch by working with a known entity like a celebrity, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult. We had a head start with Marley Natural because of that inherent brand equity that comes with a legend like Bob Marley, but it was still very difficult. You know, it was definitely one of the most fun and most stressful experiences of my working yeah, but career. You, look at, you know, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but the, the issue is there are lots of celebrity brands out there, whether they be Wiz Khalifa's or Willie Nelson's or Cheech and Chong's, each have individual brands. And when we speak to dispensary owners, they tell us that you know it's it's rare 
that a consumer comes in asking for Marley Natural or asking for Willie's Reserve. So is this a function that the consumer is really only looking for a strain or an experience or that you guys have to do a, like a shit ton of education in general around cannabis to get them to understand the brand differentiation? I think consumer behavior is still very difficult to predict in certain segments and especially with brands. I, it does lean a lot on marketing and educating consumers. The, the market is still continuing to shift. When we started Marley Natural, it was very early. It was at a time when there weren't really brands, let alone celebrity brands. So there was value in having brand and equity just coming straight out the gate because people could recognize it. Now, I don't disagree with what you're hearing from dispensaries because I hear similar feedback and talk to various verticals to understand what are the difficulties and the nuances that are happening in those segments. And right now we're going through a lot of margin compression. So everybody's struggling a little bit with prices falling on wholesale flour and there's just so much more competition. And so it, it is less about the brand and more about pricing and availability. And I think that th some of those things will work out over the course of time. I still think brands and even celebrity brands in a much more mature market are going to be very relevant. I think right now we're still a little bit too early. Consumers are going to continue to change and understand the market better, understand what they like, and that is going to influence what these brands look like. You know, celebrity brands, when you look at other industries, they started to develop much later. I think that that's how cannabis may be as well. We're seeing a lot of them early, but I don't know if there's enough stickiness around those brands yet. Uh, just because there's so much competition now. Well, there's also a problem of consistency across states, right? I mean, if Absolutely. You, you can't ship plants, you can't ship genetics. It's really hard to keep the same experience. If I get a, a pack of, you know, pre-rolled Marley Naturals in LA and then I go to, to Nevada or I go to, you know, Massachusetts, it, I expect exactly the same thing. And that's a real challenge right now. Definitely. And I think that that is something that we struggled with with Marley Natural and every brand that I've ever seen is that you're, you're really good at being a regional brand in a specific area, but then what about when you're trying to expand it? And that's an element of where brand also benefits companies because it's kind of thinking of, it's a stamp of approval. It is a consistent form as far as, you know, quality control, packaging, all of those elements. But what's inside of it is going to be different from state to state. And some people are okay with that. Some people aren't. You know, I think that we're going to continue to see adjustments in that space, and hopefully we eventually have regulation that allows for shipping across state lines, but that's just the situation that we're in right now. So you, we talked about your kind of deep financial chops, um, but, you know, we couldn't help but notice there's, you know, some social justice and nonprofits that weave their way um, throughout your resume. And this is the one industry where social justice issues and capitalism are pretty tightly intertwined. Can you talk about that a little and, and what role activism has uh, in your current role? Um, and maybe we should talk about what your current role is in MTech. <laughs> so why don't you tell us a little bit about that first? Sure. And then I'll ask my question. Excellent. Uh, so MTech is a SPAC or a special purpose acquisition company. So it is a blank check company that we IPO'd in January of this year. It's a $50 million uh, IPO. Uh, and the intent of the SPAC is to do a merger with a cannabis ancillary business. Um, and that, that company then assumes the, the SPAC and is a public entity. So I'm CFO uh, and have been working on that for most of this year so far. Um, and now I'm forgetting your previous questions. Oh, no, so, so it was a question more about, um, and we definitely want to talk about um, the, you know, what you guys are looking for, but, you know, in terms of your acquisition strategy and so forth. But um, we talked a little bit about how social justice issues and capitalism happen to be tightly intertwined in the cannabis industry um, and, and what role activism has played in your, is playing in your current role at MTech. Um, sure. Is it part of your every day or is it something that, you know, you focus on on your off hours? Although as a CFO of a company, <laughs> I don't know how many off hours you get. So, 
Well, I guess, you know, it's been interesting, too, because MTech is uh, a role I play. I also play a role with Hyperventures, which is a venture capital fund. And then I do work with other companies in the space that are more uh, startups and brands. Uh, so I wear a couple of different hats. And at different times, activism plays different roles, uh, depending on where I'm operating, you know, private sector, public sector, uh, and across the verticals in cannabis. But for me, so... Social justice and capitalism certainly are, are very intertwined in this space, and increasingly so, as we've seen the industry evolve so quickly. I think we're in a very exciting time in the industry, but it's also a little bit distressing because we continually, continually are leaving behind so many minorities who've paid a pretty heavy price for their affiliation with the industry over the last century. Uh, and I think cannabis, sometimes more than anything, is about social justice, just considering the history of the plant and how highly racialized that history is. Um, I'm a huge fan of, you know, all the shiny new dispensaries that look like Apple stores and <laughs> these luxury brands and these quirky tech platforms. But I also think that those often uh, help the populations forget where the whole history of this plant and where it came from. And I mean, I, I love shiny things. I'm all about all of this stuff, but I also believe that, you know, we have to balance it out, the innovation and the advancement and the normalization, but also remembering the communities that have been involved with it and the suffering that they've had to go through uh, in order to get to this point. So I try to work a lot with minorities or female entrepreneurs in the space, um, not necessarily through all of my current roles, but outside of that, trying to make sure that I can give time to groups like that um, in order to help advance those communities as well. So what would you say the number one social justice issue facing the, the minority or female ownership groups in the industry are? Is it, is it um, uh, criminal justice reform, like getting rid of the, the, the box on an employment form, asking if you've ever been arrested? Is it access to capital? What would you, what would you say the thing that, that's driving you, you know, driving you to get involved on this front is most? So it is all of those things, which is not a great answer, but also it is all of those things. But Primarily for me, I think it is thinking about the communities that have been impacted and how we can ensure that those barriers are removed and also we're able to advance those populations. So when we think just about policy and how certain populations have been targeted by the war on drugs and continue to be targeted even in this day and age, as we see legalization sweeping the country and the globe really, a lot of policy elements are not coming into play that address that. And we have been victims of bad policy in our history that have impacted those communities. And a lot of people can, we can turn a blind eye to it because it doesn't necessarily impact us directly, but we have to address that as we continue to create policies at the state level and not the federal level. So on the financial side though, you know, you, there is this influx of Wall Street money and, and look, you're you're right now part of it, which is a good thing. Absolutely. And, and we'll, but um, f so for MTech um, as a SPAC, which is basically a blank check company where you guys have raised capital and and your investors are expecting you to deploy that and buy buy something in this industry. So what are you looking for? What makes for a good investment? So we are focused on ancillary companies in the cannabis industry, and we're particularly focused on compliance, business intelligence, so tech platforms, uh, brands and media. Our ideal targets are those businesses that aren't confined by state lines, so they can scale nationally and internationally. And we're looking for businesses that could serve as strong anchors to future M&A activity. Um, and so there's a pretty broad range of the types of verticals within cannabis and also hemp that fall within that. Uh, but we're really looking for things that are creating infrastructure and also uh, enforce compliance and transparency in the industry. So as we record this, um, Canada, uh, it's June 29th, by the way, Canada announced that October 17th is the big day uh, for na <laughs> national legalization. It's about time. I'm moving to Canada. <laughs> Um, I mean, we know it's no surprise that it's coming. The day has been coming, and um, I 
feel like sometimes the U.S., we all feel like seems the U.S. is so stuck when it comes to Canada. Um, what impact does this have, do you think, on the American market? And do you think it'll light some kind of fire, either political fire or or financial fire um, to for the, for U.S. investors to, to kind of rise up and be like, uh, you know, look at look at this look at this country. They're able to do this. They're you know a, a rich market. They're you know a, and they're doing it and they're not you know going straight to hell. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, at least no, we no, hope no. not. We uh, well, yeah, but well, according to South Park, you have to blame Canada. Okay. Well. Okay. So blame Canada for legalizing it nationally. <laughs> I mean, what, so what impact do you think this has on the American market? I mean, besides the fact that every company that wants to go public is running to Canada, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of businesses go list in, in Canada that should really be listing here. Uh, and I think that that has really started to open people's eyes as far as how capital markets work and what public access, what the access is to public finance. Um, it was a big reason why we were looking at doing a, a different structure like the SPAC because we're capital constrained in the U.S. You know, everybody who is investing here is fa their family offices, high net worth individuals. You don't really have institutional capital because we have so many barriers around that. Uh, and there's a lot of fear that has been created because we don't have federal policy that is supportive of it. So as we see a country like Canada nationally legalize it on both the medical and the recreational side, I think it is going to push policy forward and that it is also going to encourage a lot of different groups to be much more active than they have been. You know, this really, we've seen this with a lot of uh, different people who are now coming into the market. This is a bipartisan issue. This is something that impacts everybody and everybody wants to benefit from it. So I really hope that this encourages much more policy shift in a faster timeline. Uh, because as Americans, we are our biggest roadblock in this industry right now. <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> um, so so you mentioned the capital markets and how there's this, this rush of American companies to list on the, the CFC, the, the Canadian Stock Exchange. And the, the TSX, the Toronto Stock Exchange, has said, if you, are, if you want to list here, you have to do business here. You can't do business in the United States. Mm -hmm. But you're on the NASDAQ. And you're an sure American are. company. Can you uh, explain, please? Well, so that is why we are focused on ancillary businesses. We are not going to work with companies that are plant touching. Um, and that is how we were able to get that NASDAQ listing as well. So very specific to businesses that are much more on the infrastructure side. Um, and that's, that's how that happened. <laughs> yeah, because there's you, there's Kronos. Um, there's um, the REIT on the, the New York Stock mm -hmm. Exchange, and then there's Canopy on the New York Stock Exchange. So right. I unless you are uh, an investor who is willing to play in the OTC, and look, there are a ton of fantastic publicly listed cannabis companies on the CSE and the OTC, you know, but most people are afraid of that. They're afraid of, of, of not, you know, of penny stocks or appointment trading stocks. Sure. Um, you know, when you guys make your purchase, what are you guys thinking? Uh, it, it, you think that the NASDAQ is going to let you stay? You think that you, you may get delisted? And, uh, you know, are your investors comfortable with that? Uh, so I'll answer that last one first. Our investors are comfortable with it. You know, we were very careful in selecting the group of investors who came into this, and they're very savvy people who either understand specs, understand cannabis, understand both, uh, and understand the inherent risks with being in cannabis, no matter where you are. And I think that there's just a level of risk tolerance that goes with being involved with this industry wherever you're operating. Obviously, it's a little bit more when you're plant touching, but even when you're in other verticals, there's a lot of risk with that, just given uh, the way the policies are. So, you know, if we have been able to do get approval with NASDAQ for the initial IPO and we keep in touch with them as we consider different options. And so far things are looking good. So we're just going to continue to operate on that and be as diligent and transparent as possible. And, you know, look forward to having a great business combination that we can announce. So let's, pivot a little and talk about the mainstreaming of cannabis. Uh, John Boehner joined the acreage board, uh, full disclosure, acreage is a client. Uh, mm -hmm. and you basically said like, that's nice. 
Good for you. But we've been here a while. Um, how are you squaring with you know these newcomers coming to the space? Like on on one hand, the industry needs them and their money, and they bring some semblance semblance of mainstream or quote unquote professionalism to the space. However, a bitter a pill that may be mm-hmm. for some. Um, what are your thoughts on what needs to be done to integrate the newcomers without losing the essence of of you know to your point before who built this industry on and whose back it was built on in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm pleased that people's thoughts are evolving. And the way that John Boehner put it is that, you know, his thoughts have evolved and that's why he's getting involved with the industry. It is not lost on me that there's also a decent amount of financial incentive now that people are seeing. And that also may be why people are jumping in. It's also an election year. And so you see a lot more people being vocal um, when it comes to political agendas. Um, But at the same time, I... I'm supportive of people coming into the industry in order to help further it. Uh, A lot of these groups have been involved on the policy side in the U.S. for a very long time. We need those people involved in cannabis. We also need to make sure that the education is going both sides. So people who have been in the space for a long time and understand some of the nuances or some of the, the roadblocks are able to communicate with those parties. I mean, I think something that has been a bit frustrating is that there are very distinct divides that are starting to happen now. There isn't, there isn't this overlap as we had for the earlier years. And by the earlier years, I mean like 2013, 2014, which was not that long ago. (laughs) Way back when. The the dark dark (laughs) Before there was internet (laughs) and that, you know, we're, you're not seeing that as much anymore. And I operate in an interesting space that I work with investors. I work with operating companies and kind of, across the spectrum and you see just this kind of split now between these different groups which is unfortunate because we need to make sure people are communicating with each other in order to advance both sides you know i don't love it when all of a sudden people start coming in and are like yes of course i'm on board with this it's like where were you for the past Mm, couple of decades let alone the past couple of years um but Everything takes time, and I am happy to have people starting to come over to the good side. Uh, and I just hope that we're able to work together in order to make some real positive change. You know, like John Boehner said that he is supportive because now he's starting to see evidence around uh, veterans and opioid addictions um, and how the scheduling could potentially help with the crisis that we're going through as a country. Uh, and that, in my opinion, is absolutely true. So if we can actually make real strides there, I am very supportive of it. That's great. Um, So our friends at Marijuana Business Daily did a survey, and they found that in corporate America, women hold about a quarter of leadership roles and less than 5% of CEO positions, which is sad. Uh, But in the cannabis industry, they found that women make up about 36% of leaders and in, they include 63% of high-level positions at testing labs and half of leadership roles at infused products and processing companies. Um, and I actually don't know how that breaks down for people of color. Um, I'd definitely be interested in seeing that. But um, we've spoken with a ton of female leaders in this space, and some are very aware of that fact that they are forging this new ground, and some pay that aspect of it very little attention and instead just want to kind of put their heads down and work and, and let that work speak for, for them, both of which are totally fine. I'm just wondering where on the camp you fall, or maybe it's a mix of both. Um, I'm, I guess I'm kind of a, a mix of both and just that I want to continue to support other women and, you know, minorities who are coming into the space and allow them to get into various positions and for their companies to thrive. Um, on the other side of it, I completely understand when women just want to put their head down and work because there's so much to do and you don't really have all this bandwidth and all these resources. Um, so sometimes you just, that's all you have the ability to do. And, you know, so I understand that perspective as well. For me personally, because of the experiences that I've had and the opportunities that I've been able to have in this space, I feel very strongly about being vocal about these various elements and helping other people get, you know, move ahead and kind of that pay it forward mentality because I didn't get here by myself. Um, and I think it's hard. I think it's hard for anybody to get to the position that they want to by themselves. So I, I feel a 
a responsibility and a duty to do that in the space. So let's let's do a little thought experiment, shall we? Um, it seems we like shall. we shall. Um, let's go back to to graduate school, and mm-hmm. you're sitting in some management class, and your professor um, says to you. It seems like the, the speed at which the industry is not only being normalized and mainstreamed is, is increasing, um, but that it – that was really weird. Um, but, but that on the federal level, you know, the states have always been the, 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 you know, the, the, the crucible where legislation and regulation is tried. But it seems at the federal level it's moving faster, right? We had the, the hemp bill passed. Um, we've got the the state's bill from Gardner and from um, Senator Warren. Um, we had um, our, our good friend uh, – well, he's not actually our good friend. I've never met the man. But uh, Chuck Schumer's bill that was proposed recently. Um, and yeah. it seems like the president himself um, has really – seem to embrace the concept of legalization. So what would happen tomorrow? Like literally tomorrow. If Donald Trump came on the 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 news today and went on, you know, Fox News and said, I have directed the DEA to reschedule cannabis from a schedule one drug to nothing or a schedule four, which is basically nothing. What happens tomorrow? What does the industry look like? What does it look like a year from now? And what does it look like three years from now? If it was com- made completely legal, well, I think not, that not were- legal, but descheduled, right? Which is well, slightly yeah. different. So descheduled, there's still issues with, well, for rescheduling. So if you reschedule it to one of the lower levels, and I'm not sure where the break comes in, but there are different elements of where FDA is still involved and, um, probably difficulties around some of that. So I don't think it's going to be, you know, a free for all. Uh, There still be, there will still be very interesting nuances that we have to work through, like ability for banking and, uh, you know, some of these more uh, policy plays. Uh, But I do think that that's where you start seeing institutional capital coming into play and larger companies that have probably been eyeing this space for a while. And we start hearing about some of them that are partnering with Canadian companies, I think we start hearing about those a lot more publicly and coming into the space. Uh, The negative of that, I think, is that a lot of companies that are in this space now that have been struggling their way for the last couple of years to build a bigger foundation are then completely blown out because they don't have the infrastructure or capital yet. So I'm, I'm in favor of keeping it um, a little bit more constrained so these businesses can further develop and, and create the platforms that they want to in order to be those companies that eventually succeed in the space. And I think there's a little bit of, of mix of that. You know, we do need some of these major players to come in. Uh, but I think, I mean, it would, be, it would be really interesting. I'd be probably have a heart attack if that happened. But um, <laughs> I think everybody would. Yeah, I don't, I, I would, yeah. I, it's like, what's that line? He's going to shit and then he's going to kill me. Well, what's he going to do? He's going to kill you first. It's like, I mean, you know, the good thing would be is there would be no more arrests. Right. And hopefully we could get people to expunge, um, uh, criminal records so that people who were arrested for selling a dime bag can actually get a license. Um, but that's not the question I wanted to follow up with. My, my question is this, you're seeing, um, some consolidation already happening, right? You, mm-hmm. you saw Aurora buy Med Relief, and um, uh, Alan Brockstein um, had said uh, one, on one of our first episodes that he really thought that 2018 would be the beginning of the MA wave. Mm-hmm. Do you see this happening in the second half of the year that some of these guys are going to start to eat each other? Absolutely. I think Alan is completely right. And I. Re- respect uh, his analysis on this industry and he's been doing it for a while and I had a very similar viewpoint you know thinking about this in 2015 2016 it did seem like 2018 2019 would really be the time frame that M&A activity would start heating up and I think we're already seeing that and it's it's a bit surprising at the pace that we're starting to see it uh it, it has a lot to do with the fact that we have access to IPO markets in Canada because you have this publicly traded currency that people are allowed to use now in order to do these transactions. The biggest issue before, not the biggest, but one of the biggest ones is that 
how do you get these types of deals done? You know, you, there's only so much cash that any of these businesses have. And now that there's a little bit more you know, nuance to how you can do these structures and um, the, the ability to do that, I think we're going to see that even more. And it makes sense because getting to economies of scale in this business in any vertical that you're in is very difficult. And so you're starting to see a lot of synergies between businesses and complementary businesses come together. And, and they're realizing that. Everybody used to be a lot more defensive around their business because you just had so many people that you're fighting with. And you wanted to be very protective of whatever you thought your competitive advantage was. And now I think people are understanding that in order to get bigger, in order to scale, get to whatever that level is that they're aspiring to be, that these partnerships and these relationships and mergers make a lot more sense. And now we so have vehicles to do them. And we can go back to blaming Canada, right? Because were it not for Canada, we would have seen a lot more M&A activity in the United States. But the Canadian capital markets have facilitated the, the, the access to cash that a lot of these companies might not have. Yeah, absolutely. And that's encouraging more groups to run a little bit faster in order to try to get some of these deals done or try. It's also encouraging, I think, other investors to perhaps put up a little bit larger numbers in order to help with these transactions because everybody wants to be that merger or yeah. acquisition target. When is the fatigue going to set in, though, on the, the investors? Because you're seeing the same banks. You're seeing oftentimes the same investors coming into these deals. At some point, they're going to go, oh, I'm full. I can't eat anymore. Oh, I don't think that's happening anytime soon. Um, I think we're starting to see more people come into it. And so maybe there's fatigue from people who started in like 2009, 2010, because they're waiting for liquidity. Uh, and they've been ha having to wait quite some time. But I see so many new investors coming into the space that I think that fatigue cycle isn't going to happen for a while because they're just there's so many more players and you see more banks wanting to get into it in Canada, but also in the U.S. We're starting to see other uh, big names starting to look at this or wanting to do coverage or whatever. And mm -hmm. I think that that's going to continue to evolve. And you'll probably have some influence from people who are already investors influencing these financial institutions to say, you know, you guys need to be involved. And there are people who have significant capital that are working with these financial institutions saying, like, you should be, why are you not in this? Uh, and I think that we're just seeing the beginning of that, especially in the U.S. When do you think that you're going to see, a, you know, a, a big, either big venture fund or big private equity fund use institutional and not partner money to, to get into some of these deals. Like I can't see Kleiner Perkins sitting on the side for much longer, right? They're going to want to get in because the, the returns, the potential returns are what they're looking for. I don't think it's that far away, but we still have to wait for the right policy changes because all of these institutional groups need to protect their investors and, you know, protect their foundation. And, you know, they're risk averse when it comes to some of these things and as they should be. Um, but I don't think that they're that far away because the market is now requiring that type of capital to come into it or is getting it's starting to. It's still pretty early as far as the sizes that we're seeing. Um, but I think it's a couple of years. I mean, don't hold me to that. But that's what I think. Less than that. Hmm. Well, we're not going to hold you to it, so don't worry about it. Um, Good. Nobody, <laughs> nobody else can either. <laughs> I say it's nonsense. Uh, so we're going to do uh, everyone's favorite segment called Puff Puff Pass, where we ask you to do two things you love about the industry and one thing you hate about the industry. So Tahira, Puff Puff Pass. Hmm. Okay. So I love that this industry is one that crosses generations and socioeconomic tiers. I mean, I, to me, it's something that can positively impact and benefit everybody uh, on either side of the table and everywhere in between. Um, and maybe it'll even just chill people out, which is the ultimate outcome. <laughs> um, so I, I love how this industry is, it involves so many different types of people and so many different types of industries. Um, and that's one of the major thing that's attracted me to it. Um, my other love continues to be something, the, the fact that we're creating something new every day. I mean, even if you've been in this for, a couple of years, which everybody talks about it being dog years, 
every day is still different and it feels like we're really marching in the right direction and making real change, yeah, which yeah. is really important to me. Corey, Corey Booker described it as forcing a bend in the arc of history towards justice. And mm -hmm. you know, I love that. Absolutely. And that is something that I'm very passionate about. And I think a lot of people in the space, you know, everybody has a different reason for being in cannabis. And I think that that even it evolves. My, my viewpoint certainly has as well to include much more. Um, but the fact that this has been able to have such an impact in so many different areas, I, I just, I love that aspect of it. I think I would be absolutely bored doing anything else. Um, and, your, and your pass. My pass. Um, I, you know, talked about this quite a bit. I, I do struggle with the fact that the industry has shifted so quickly to accommodate those who come from a position of privilege and has been somewhat prohibitive to those who have not and would like to continue to focus on that and be vocal about it and hopefully encourage more change there uh, because it, it keeps getting faster and faster and I'm really concerned about just leaving these groups behind. Well, yeah. Awesome. Well, so Thanks, Sahira. That, thanks, guys. Um, we want to make sure we're mindful of your time. Um, thanks again to Tahira Ramatula, the CFO of MTech Acquisitions. They trade on the NASDAQ under the ticker MTECU. You can find Tahira online at Tahira Rem, that's at T A H I R A R E H M, on Twitter and Instagram. As always, thanks for listening. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and give us a rating and a review. If you have a comment or a question, we'd also love to hear from you. Check us out at KCSA underscore cannabis on both Twitter and Instagram, or drop us an email at thegreenrush at kcsa.com. That's, That's one 27 take, Shay. takes, Shay. 27. One take. Mm, closer to 27.